Hi, this is Dayton Ward, and you're listening to Beyond Trek Podcast. Or I don't know what level of freedom you have to discuss plot points from the new novel, but because it hasn't come out yet, obviously none of us have read it, so there's going to be some questions that may tiptoe along the line. I don't know what you're uncomfortable saying or anything like that, so I just want to kind of get like a... a you can ask an anything you want. I will, okay. I will choose not to answer if I think it's... I don't mean not to be difficult or anything. I just I don't want to spoil anything for anybody who hasn't Perfect. Right. That, so. and, I have- and I don't want to spoil anything for you guys either. I have oh, a follow-up no. question to that, but first, I want to thank the listeners. Welcome to Be On Trek Podcast. We are on episode 202 today. If you watched the Noah episode, that's probably a spoiler because this episode's going to come out first, because tomorrow is release day for the first in the trilogy of the last, possibly the last bit of the Litverse. I'm Dag. Renzo and Jay are in the house with me, and we have author Dayton Ward hanging out to talk about the release of book one in the CODA trilogy, Moments Asunder. Dayton, welcome. Hi. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. This is all David Mack's fault. I, uh, yes. Well, you know, in, in large part. Yes. <laughs> Glad we're in agreement. I tweeted at him, and I was like, hey, let's talk about it. And he's like, cool. I don't want to spoil anything from book one, so here's Dayton. I was like, oh. Okay, I'll just talk to all three of you then. Awesome. <laughs> Worst day here's, ever. Here's the bus. So Welcome as you may have picked up, it. we're going to have a special interview with all three authors coming up over the course of the next couple months. Hey, Boy, that ought to be fun trying to coordinate time zones. Well, at first, when I pitched, when David pitched to me, I thought he was talking about like get all three of you in the same call, and I was like, how do you get six people to arrange like for two hours at any length of time at the same time? It's impossible. Time zones are hard. Oh. Well, it's, it's the, the, the difficulty level gets you know higher when we factor in Jim because he's over in the UK. Oh, oh that kills it right there. Yeah, we already have hard enough time. I'm on the East Coast. Dag's on the West Coast, so we literally have two ends of the u.s we're trying to mm-hmm. schedule because a good evening time for me he's just getting off work probably <laughs> uh, so yeah you're right in those those uk folks we would have to be like dag we're talking 8 a.m for you which is close to bedtime out there uh so it, it's a nightmare yeah, it is Maybe on a weekend or something. I, I actually have a trivia show slated with those UK folks, and I have to get up arse early just to be in it. So, yay! Yeah. <laughs> Dayton, you have over 41 credits to your name for Trek literature. You're, you have a, a word, you have a term named after you about being warded. Like if you've written for three of the different uh, what are those? Uh, Renzo, oh, oh, you know what they you are. Mean the, you, mean the, you mean the wardy. Yeah. All right. So anyway, to to start off, that's an unofficial, like, honor. <laughs> so, it was. Um, it has to do with the Strange New Worlds writing contests that took place during the late '90s and early 2000s, and under the rules of that contest, you, you were only eligible to submit if you were a non-professional writer, meaning that you had fewer than three professional writing credits. So short stories or or one novel. So you couldn't if you were if you exceeded that, then you were not eligible to enter the contest. So I entered the first contest having never sold anything to anyone, um, and I won a berth in that first anthology. And then I repeated the second and third year. So I, I essentially rendered myself ineligible to enter the contest. And so somebody, Ted, a friend of ours, uh, uh, I I can never say his. Uh, real name properly, so I'll use his pen name, T.G. Theodore, who is also a Strange New Worlds winner, um, coined that term, Wardy, for anybody who got three Strange New Worlds story wins and got knocked out of the competition. I just think that's a really cool bit of trivia for yeah. the listeners who may not have paid so much attention to uh, what was happening in that competition. It was way back in the before time, you know, when the world was still black and white. Yeah, and then they invented color, and that was largely regarded as the second worst idea in creation. How long does it take to to prepare for something like that, uh, just for the for the contest? And what was it that you that you wrote for that? Did you just make up a make up a story? 
Essentially, yeah. I mean, they, they, they announced the contest in, I want to say, the, either the late spring or very early summer of 1997. And that's, I just dated myself. So there we go. That's, that's, or that's, I started to date myself. It gets even worse than that. Um, so I wrote a story, and I don't remember how long it took, probably a month or so uh, before I submitted it. And then I didn't hear anything about it until they announced the winners um, in November of 97, somewhere in that neighborhood either October or November, I don't remember exactly now. Mm -hmm. And then the book came out the following June uh, in bookstores. So just the, as far as the degree of preparation, it was a short story. It was seven, 7,500 words, I think, was the, is the max limit for those things. And I probably wrote it and edited it over the course of a month or more before submitting it. And back in those days, submitting it was you literally printed out a copy and put it in an envelope and mailed it. You know, whereas now today everything's done electronically. Right. Um, the old-fashioned days, printing mm -hmm. envelope, putting postage on it. Yeah. So you, you seem to have a, uh, a a frequent writing partner for a lot of the stories they wrote, especially in the early days and the SCE days. You wrote a lot with Kevin Dilmore, right? And as a pair, you guys wrote a couple of my favorite of the Star Trek novels in the whole universe. You wrote the uh, Time to Sew, etc. And so those are fantastic ones. What made you um? decide to work so well or what what made him such a good partner for you to work with like how did that relationship work out like as a writing partner it seemed like well i mean first of all we were, we were friends before we started to write together oh. but we became friends because of the strange new worlds contest i that first year that i won the contest he was writing on a freelance basis for the old star trek communicator magazine oh uh, and a few of those Right, and so he got the assignment, or he asked for the assignment to interview that first crop of Strange New Worlds winners. There were 18 of us in that first book, and he sent out emails to people uh, with the, you know, with the questions that he had prepared. And somehow he, for whatever reason, they, I don't think he ever really explained why, because things could have turned out so differently. Um, rather than email me the questions, he found out that we lived about 45 minutes from each other. So he said, hey, how about we meet in the middle for a beer and I'll just ask you the questions. Uh, he's that kind of guy who he, he's, you know, he'll, he, he can make anybody, he could be a friend to anybody. So we ended up doing the interview, but when he sat there and shot the breeze for, you know, another hour or two, and then we started hanging out, going, doing stuff together. And, you know, our wives were very excited because we had a playmate finally to do with the <laughs> stuff, the nerdy stuff. And uh, that was, you know, that was 97, 98. So we've been friends ever since. And uh, the, so the writing part uh, kind of came naturally. We actually teamed up to do a magazine article for Star Trek Communicator first. And then um, it just blossomed into writing you know, a couple of novellas for the SCE series, if you've ever read any of those. Absolutely. Our Fleet Corps of Engineers. And then just it kind of snowballed out of control from there. I mean, we're still writing together. We just recently finished a story that we sent to an anthology that'll, for, for publication next year. I think that's so great. I, I love the idea of just kicking back and spitballing ideas about, oh, what if what if these people were in this situation? How would they get into it? How would they get out of it? And I just think that, um, you know, I, I definitely relate to that. And I think that's awesome. We just did it this weekend. We just brainstormed a couple of ideas to pitch to, to a particular editor. And um, we have, you know, hopes and dreams of doing particular things, uh, Star Trek and otherwise. Uh, yeah, it's, we, we don't write as many novels as we used to. Uh, together, I think the last one we did together was the for the Legacies trilogy back in mm -hmm. 2016. But we've, we've discovered that we really dig doing different types of short stories. So in the past couple of years, I think we've done a half a dozen. Uh, for different types of anthologies one was a was a space western uh, one is a, like an old school pulp fiction adventure tales type anthology uh, one was a horror anthology set in the 80s in a movie theater because that was the what the theme of the entire anthology was you know movies 80 movieplex 80s movieplex so we just uh we just been having fun with it we make ourselves laugh and then if anybody else comes along and laughs then it's gravy see yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. You. You guys. You in particular, I think, have gone have gone and used some of the most creative choices for characters in some of your short stories. Like in almost but not quite, you took Belmore and Luxley and added them to the uh, the stories of Tuvok and Tom Paris in like the United States and their time travel shenanigans. Right. Like that's yes. that's a real clever like taking of a couple characters from Deep Space Nine and dropping them into the Voyager situation just because they're back on Earth in the time travel. Right. Like it's it's very impressive some of the some of the ideas that you guys came up with or that you came up with in that case thank, thank you i mean I, I chances are good that i may have bounced i mean a chance it's, it's probably as 
it's probably right more often than not that I will bounce ideas off him, even if he and I are not working together on a project. I still use him as my sounding board. I still use him as my principal. Hey, does this idea suck or do I think do you think I can actually do something with it? So, yeah, even if we're not collaborating, he's still collaborating with me. A lot so, of chicken wings, a lot of beer. So. Yeah, oh, chicken wings and beer. Now I want some chicken <laughs> wings. So w whenever I would read a Star Trek book, and I have to admit, it's been a long while since I read a Star Trek book. But when I would read any of the books, what made it easy for me was knowing the characters. And if there were different characters written in that, uh, of course, had never been in any, uh, any series or movie, I would play the scenes in my head with the locations of the characters. It was kind of like watching a like a movie in your head sort of thing. So when you're writing these these stories in these books, do you find that Star Trek is easier because you you know the characters, you can hear their voices in your head, you know how they how they act, how they respond as opposed to just a a novel that's about something else. Is, is Star Trek easier to write for? because you're more familiar with the characters and how they're played, what they do, what their motivations are, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know that writing Star Trek or any kind of tie-in fiction is, is easier or harder than writing original fiction. They are, they are challenging for different reasons. Okay. Uh, when it comes to writing something like Star Trek or Star Wars or any of these other properties that spin off novels, you know, a lot of the world building is done for you. A lot of the backstory is established for you. Even in a lot of cases, the characters are established for you. So your job is to go in there and do something interesting with them. And depending on the wants and desires of the of the property holder, you know, how, how much you can play with them and what condition you can leave them in when you put them back in the box. Um, so that's the challenge. The challenge is to work within that perimeter that has been established by the property and not violate the canon, not violate you know, stories that you've watched on TV and in de depending on the nature of the project, other books that have been written. Um, and then doing all of that while trying to come up with something new and interesting for these characters to do. And, it, you know, it's it, it's a sliding scale of difficulty based on the longevity of the particular series. Uh, mm -hmm. But at the same time, my familiarity with the characters is also on a similar scale. I mean, I'm, I'm an original series fan from from, you know, way back when, like the 70s. Um, so my familiarity with Kirk and the gang is, is I, I, I believe it's pretty good. Um, and then it's just on a scale from there. I'm, I'm you know, next gen DS9 all the way down. Um, so so I just, know those voices. I know those voices and those mannerisms. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I can, I can close my eyes and uh, I know how Kirk's going to sound when he's uptight. I know he's going to sound when he's mad, you know, um, when he's ready to take the bull by the horns. Uh, I just know how he's going to react. It's almost, a, you know, a, you can almost predict the words that are going to come out of his mouth like you would if you were watching a rerun. Um, it's it, That's helpful. That helps with the characterizations. Uh, the challenge, again, is to just try to find something new and, and different that hasn't been done before, you know, with these characters, which is a tall order for characters that have had stories told about them for 50 plus years. Right. And yeah. And thousands right. of stories, you know. So, uh, it gets, it's challenging. Yeah. So you happen to, to hit, up. I'm sorry, go ahead, Brandon. You happen to hit upon something that I'm actually really interested in knowing more about, right? The verisimilitude between different works, right? You s just mentioned how you, like, you have to make sure you don't contradict other stories and other people's canons that they've worked on, right? What kind of effort did you go through when you were writing, like, A Time to Harvest to make sure that you didn't conflict with something from A Time to Be Born or something that was being written later on in the series, like A Time to Kill or something, or, or in any of the works, right? Or even now with CODA series, right? How, what kind of research are you doing to make sure that what you write doesn't smush somebody somebody else's canon that they had written in their story? Well, when it comes to something like, like the Time to books and uh, especially the CODA books, um, you know, we the authors communicate with each other. We all are in are, are in communication with each other, and we're playing off each other. We're setting stuff up for somebody in a later book, or we're playing off something that somebody set up for the book in the book ahead of us. Um, and plus, there's the editor. You know, there we have the editor at, at, at Pocket Books, or at Simon and Schuster, who is acting more or less the way a showrunner would work in a writer's room on a television show. They're they're overseeing the big picture. They they keep all the trains on their respective tracks. And so they're reading all the manuscripts and they're making sure that, oh, you didn't, you know, we killed off that security guard in book four, so we can't pop up in book seven. Yeah, that kind of thing. 
um, and so much more. I mean, I don't want to, I'm not just diminishing the role of the editor. They are a vital part of this process. Um, so in the case of Coda, you know, we were, we, we probably leveled up the level of communication that we normally do for these collaborative efforts because so much seemed, at least in our minds, to be at stake. Um, you know, we were in constant communication throughout the process. We, we broke the story together, all three books. Uh, we worked out which beats were going to be in which book. You know, we wished that which characters were going to be represented in which book and how the story was going to flow through each book and set up, you know, what was I going to do in book one that would set up book two and what was Jim going to do that would set up Dave in book three. And, you know, we didn't turn anything in to an editor until we were all happy with the outlines for all three books. And then we presented the entire package to our editors at Simon & Schuster. And they edited the entire trilogy of, of outlines together. And then we all took our notes to our corners and we figured everything out. And then we went to our corners and wrote the manuscripts and we kept talking back and forth. And we, hey, I've got this idea. We, we hash it out to make sure everybody was on board. Or, hey, the idea I thought was awesome really sucks. We need to go back and rethink this. Or I forgot about a plot hole from another episode or uh, that kind of thing. Um, it was very collaborative from start to finish. I mean, almost literally to the point the book, the first book got printed. <laughs> we were all weighing in on something. I so think that's there beautiful. was, yeah, there was a, a Rinda really like asked uh, the question I was going to ask, but then you brought up something that we're on the same wavelength, Rinda. I don't know how we do it, <laughs> uh, but there was another part I wanted to expand on when you're talking about doing a book series like this. Star Trek Coda, you have the other authors, you guys are working together to make sure that you're not tripping over or canceling out something that someone else did, kind of like what happened in the Star Wars sequel trilogy. It was basically the guy that did the eighth movie acted like the seventh didn't even happen. And then the ninth one had to try to fix other stuff. So it was just, it was a disaster. So when you're trying not to step over each other I know that the the books have to follow the canon the TV shows and movies don't have to follow anything in the books so let's go back even further you have all these books and you have to assume that the number of people that have watched episodes and movies Star Trek will be a lot higher than ones who have read any books and we still have some trouble with the over 800 episodes trying to keep the <laughs> canon all consistent there sure there are mistakes there are mess ups here and there but for the books how do you even begin to to have a a knowledge of all these books because it, it, it sounds like in the in the movies and shows you try to maintain canon there the books are also trying to do that but how how do you do that when you don't you don't have an episode or you you don't have a rewatch you can do of all the episodes and movies you've got what hundreds of books that that were out there about star trek so how do you even begin to know that well this this one deep space nine novel that was released in 1998 uh we we can't do this because they did that where how do you how do you even handle that there's there's no way to read everything and remember everything that's just impossible right. Um, right so when it came down to coda we started gathering our thoughts about what we wanted the series to do and how we wanted to showcase you know sets of characters and then once we had a rough idea of what we wanted to include we started digging in a little bit on all right what's the status of these characters in the books what where were they last seen what were they last seen doing what's their you know where are they um and they're all over the map you know if you if you've been reading the books you know that you know they're all over the place um some storylines are in were in flux or still in or could be described as being in flux others had wound down to a point where we you know we could decide do we want to try to include them is what's still on the table relevant to the story we need to tell in these three books because there's a lot of work to do in these three books um so we did all of that everybody once we figured out which characters were going to be showcased in in the story and at which points in the story we started figuring out okay that's where we left that person it's where that you know that character uh what they're doing now and depending on how or what they're doing when we pick them up again how do we reintegrate them into the main narrative 
uh, it was a lot of there was a lot of pre-planning in this. We spent months uh, working out these kind of details before we even wrote an outline. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So it was it was that kind of pre-plan, and that's the le that's a level of pre-planning that we just usually don't get to do. I mean, you, normally I'm given an assignment to write a book, I go do my research, I write an outline, I turn it in, uh, and I'm a one-man band. And that's the same for all of the other authors. But for something like this, yeah, there was just there was literally months of back of back and forth emails and Skype calls and brainstorming and coming up with ideas and discarding ideas and coming up with better ideas. And then then we started doing our you know research and you know websites like Memory Alpha and Memory Beta are great starting points for that kind of thing. Like okay, now I know I got to go look at this book. I got to go look at this episode. I got to go mm -hmm. do this and pare it all down into something manageable you know tame the beast as best we can yeah right. i mean you seem to have like some favorite characters right like every author does they're gonna you it seems like really like toric as a character the vulcan right you seem to like put him into most of your novels were there any moments when you were writing your outlines for coda where you're like man if i had another 15 pages i would definitely stick toric in here somewhere or anything along those lines any little personal favorites that you just wanted to include somewhere to figure out where they ended up their 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 stories i Without spoiling anything in book one, I got to use m pretty much all the characters that I hoped to uh, to use. I mean, I, I had been writing, I had written several of the next generation novels that lead up to Coda. Mm -hmm. So I had a pretty good grip on where they were. Um, but of course, you know, we're talking about in the cases of the books, we're talking about on screen characters that have evolved over the course of all these novels, but also the characters that we were that we either created or repurposed from some other part of star trek to to incorporate into our crew on the enterprise because other characters have gone you know gone in different directions um so yeah because my book is set primarily with the enterprise crew um i got to use those characters again um so i was able to insert them into the narrative the way i i saw fit for the story um and then same thing with jim and dave you know we each have our we, we each have our favorites and we each have our personal our, our personal kinks so I think we, and that was part of it, was you know angling the storyline. So okay, he wants to do this with this set of characters. So how do we set up the narrative to flow to that naturally? Uh, there was that was again part of that part of that brainstorming that we did before we even wrote outlines involved a lot of that. So is that leads me to my. Oh, go ahead, Jay. Uh, just real quick. So is there, how far back do you go before you say there? There's no reasonable expectation that events, especially small events that happened in a book past 2010 or 2005 or whatever it is is there kind of that that floor that that says okay we we shouldn't have that expectation that we're going back to the books in the 70s to make sure that we don't say uh -oh. something here that contradicts something there unfortunately that ship sailed years before i even got involved um, you know, the old Bantam books from the 70s were usually one-offs that did not even bother referencing the other books in that, in, from that publisher, unless it was written by the same author. And yeah. even that was a rarity. I think only a couple of authors wrote more than one book. Nobody uh, needs to read it, Spock Messiah again. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. Oh, I, even I read that one. Jesus. And, and then the same thing with the early pocket novels. You know, a lot of those were standalones, and yeah, a lot yeah. of them did not reference each other. They, you know, they didn't necessarily overtly trip over each other, but they, they didn't. There, there, there was, was a episodic time. As a show. There was a time when that sort of thing was not uh, encouraged by by the licensing office, uh, where they didn't want to see ongoing narratives with original characters. They wanted everything to focus on the prime. Excuse the expression. The prime crew. <laughs> um, that the, the 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 ability to inter interconnect and inter interweave and intertwine the narratives from different novel series is is over the course of Trek publishing a fairly recent uh, you know evolution uh, going back twenty years and even then it was sort of it was small and isolated and just sort of kind of snowballed as the years moved on and things started getting more and more inserted into different narratives and you could you could pluck characters from deep space nine and put them on next generation or you could take tar or you know tuvok from voyager and put them on the titan mm -hmm. you know yeah. and things like that um so it just sort of grew organically and with all the different authors that were that were contributing to the different novel lines at that point it just sort of kind of just, just a critical mass where it just was its own you know living thing that just kept going on if you're uh 
if you're worried about that or thinking about that being so convoluted, I won't even tell you about the comics and the oh. period of I don't remember He's how long some. it was, but there were there was a time where there were several comic issues. Uh, Kirk was captain of the Excelsior mm -hmm. and, and his yeah. crew because uh, they had they had lost the Enterprise, did the whole yeah. the events of uh, Star Trek for. Uh, yeah, the, the three somewhere in there, they had this whole thing where, yeah, the, the Enterprise wasn't available, it was being built or whatever. It, I don't know. Kirk was captain of the Excelsior, so they took the Enterprise crew and they had to, they put them there in the in the yeah. interim. So yeah, that was a completely random. Like we're just going to do this thing that makes no sense. But not no, necessarily was, contradictory to anything else, at least. It actually makes perfect sense. Um, and, I, and again, I'm going to date myself. I started reading that comic series with issue number one. <laughs> in 1984 <laughs> and the first issue came out not that long after Star Trek 2 and or it came out shortly before Star Trek 3 came out so but it picked up shortly after the events of Star Trek 2 and they were able to do their own thing for a couple of issues and then Star Trek 3 came along so and of course the folks writing the comics were aware that the film was coming they had a, they had access to the script and they knew what was going to happen so they tailored their storyline to marry up with the film and then as a lead out of Star Trek three, that's where you get the Excelsior. You know, it's like, okay, yeah. we know the Enterprise is gone, but the but the Excelsior is going to be here. And so they're gonna work with that for a few issues. And then, you know, Star Trek four comes along. And you'll notice if you go back and look at the issues that came out before Star Trek four hit theaters, you'll start to see the storyline wind its way back to the track that Star Trek four is on. And then it's just a natural bleed in. Um, yeah. It's funny you bring up the comics because I've used that those same comics as an analogy to what we're doing with the books. It's like every once in a while, new Star Trek comes along and the stuff that's been going willy nilly in books and comics has to change lanes to be in step with what's on screen. Kind of like uh, the new 52 yep. from the, the DC side. So that DC had to do it three or four times over the course of its short life. You know, those first 50 odd issues that came out, I think it, it had to, you know, it had to change step at least three times across three different when three different movies came out that i think what you just said there is the perfect segue into the big question that's been on my mind and that the three of us have been battling around since we david mack started this whole thing uh, in october of 2014 we're all aware that lucasfilm just said anything that's come out before this time is now legends and anything that comes after this will be considered the new canon. So it allowed authors who had explored the world in the past to explore the world in a different way. Is Coda kind of like that reset for Star Trek Lipverse? I don't know if I would call it a reset so much as I would call it a transition. Okay. Um, you know, the idea is that the stories that you have read over the past 20 odd years in particular, as they pertain to Coda, um, they, they did happen. And they do exist, you know, and they're not canon. They never, you know, no, no Star Trek novels canon has never been canon. Uh, mm -hmm. That said, we write them to be consistent with the canon as we know it to be when we're writing it. Uh, and we, we can only future proof so far. I right. mean, you know, when I started doing this, you know, nobody thought there's no way they're going to bring back Next Generation. There's no way they're going to bring back Captain Picard. No right. way. They're done. You know, couldn't never going to happen. <laughs> never say never in the world of time writing. <laughs> See, and that kind of um, oh, go ahead. No, you're fine. That's I mean, that's so basically, yeah. I don't I don't want to call it a reset, um, a transition. You know, to to again to get back into step with what's on screen. That's what we're doing. Yeah. So, how do you feel about shows like Lower Decks that are taking uh, concepts from ancient canon, like TAS, which for for a while was also decanonized, or taking ideas from books and comics and such, and bringing them into the canon again by way of an animated show? I have absolutely no problem with it whatsoever. I Lower Decks is gonna just twist up everything. Lower Decks is there to just just scramble your eggs, man. Yes, um, I love it. Is. <laughs> I love Lower Decks. I love the fact that uh, it brings in stuff from the animated show because I'm a huge fan of the original animated series. That's and what our first interview I was love, about today. I love seeing those little those little callbacks to the animated show. Oh, when yeah. I first saw the script that had the 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 description of the skeleton Spock, <laughs> <laughs> that's literally I, what we talked about with our previous guests today. 
that I episode and that so hard yeah. at that when I read that I said I can't wait to see that and then because of what I do with CBS I was able to see early animation and you know the first shots of that scene just I I, I, I couldn't even if I wanted to I couldn't take a screenshot because of the way the software right. works it let you take a, a screen print but I'm like taking pictures of it with my phone <laughs> so that I could send it to my boss at CBS and it's like I can't believe they're gonna do this yeah <laughs> well and the, the thing that I really like about Lower Decks is because the the animated series for the longest time was uh, not considered canon and then it got canonized and what I like about Lower Decks is they are hammering home that the events in the animated series are canon it's mm -hmm. like it's, it's, they're hitting you with that rubber mallet of we're going to reference all these things from the animated series it is canon it, we can't we can't let fo folks uh, avoid it it is here and the, I think the number of references that they make in track to the animated series seems like a little more than any other that, that's kind of the impression that that i have is that they they are pulling things from the animated series more than any of the other past trek series i don't know for sure if that's true but i suspect you are correct um i know that i count the easter eggs i i specifically look for animated easter eggs um mm -hmm. And, 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 and as silly as this sounds, one of the tasks that I am sometimes given is to go through a set of episodes and find all the Easter eggs and, and record them so that we can, you know, refer to them for various reasons. Um, and I, I, I there's a lot there's a lot across all the shows. I mean, yep. it's some of some of the stuff is just almost throwaway. If you're not paying attention, you you don't even notice it. Right. And I'm right. I, I consider myself pretty hardcore. And I've missed a few Easter eggs, uh, particularly that one episode with all with the collector and his museum and all that oh, stuff. Oh yeah. Every time I went back, I'm like, I can't believe I missed that. God damn it! You know, I mean, I, mean, I did that five <laughs> or six times in one day. Did you? Uh, no, I the, did season you. the season opener was like that for me. I'm a Star Ships guy. I love ships. If you show me a ship, I'm like, oh, that's originally from this video game published in 1996. That first scene with Mariner breaking out of that prison, I was like, that's a snipe, or is it a Falcon? <laughs> Mm, I wonder which version of it. And I was just pausing next frame. No, that's not a Hideki. That's not a Hideki, but it looks like one kind of thing. <laughs> I love the way that this show just makes you really like go back and look over frame by frame sometimes. I think uh, yes, it does. I think yeah, my favorite part of the most recent episode was uh, have you seen it yet? The one uh, where Mariner and joking, right? I've seen them all. <laughs> okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah. My bad. It's it comes with the job, man. Sorry. I'm blaming David again. Um, yeah. Not he's so, read the script but, apparently. But like my favorite part of of that episode was at the very end, the CBS burn. That was so nice, and then <laughs> Batman like two doors down. That was so cool. Um, especially because where I lived, uh, where I lived, DS9 aired on CBS, so it's like just another no. Go ahead. Slap oh. to. Uh, oh, did you guys lose me? I think uh, either somebody froze. It was. It could have been. Uh, me. Might have been you. I. It sounded like Dad kept going just fine. Oh. Okay. <laughs> um, Subspace anomaly. Subspace uh, anomaly. We're good. It's a wormhole. The thing is, I'll read the scripts and they'll describe various Easter eggs, but they'll bake in so much more once they actually get to animation. That's not in the script. Yeah. Um, you know. So, in fact, the uh, I think it was, well, it was last year when the, we right before the first episode premiered of the first season. Uh, my boss sent me a screen grab from the first episode and he said I looked at this for 10 minutes and didn't see it you know and I'm like that sounds like one of those scam emails that you open up and there's a virus in it so I, <laughs> I looked at it and I'm like I don't I don't know what you're talking about I, I don't know and it's a picture of like Mariner and Boimler in a closet and I'm looking and I'm looking I'm like what am I supposed to be looking at I don't know what I'm looking for and then finally I saw it again like after five or ten minutes it's Nomad the Nomad probe is oh. just propped in a corner in the foreground and I'd been staring at it for almost ten minutes and I didn't see it <laughs> that's I love that <laughs> that's like that's not in the script yeah when so, we yeah. do when we do our episode teardowns we have a section that we just go through all right here is all the deep cuts that they are mm -hmm. referencing all the Easter eggs um, and we try to get as many as possible, and then we urge, you know, the audience find find more. You can find more than us. There was one in an episode that they, uh, I can't remember who was wearing it, but the Spock helmet that was a toy. Oh yeah, the ba yeah yeah yeah. yeah. And uh, it, it, it was it yeah. was not in any freaking TV episode. Nothing. It was a toy 
And one of the characters had that on. Yep. Like, oh, and wow, now, that is, yeah, yeah. yeah. Spock's, Spock's I knew that hat. one was coming because that one was in the script. They they explicitly called that out in the script. Like, you know, oh, nice. this locker full of stuff. That. The well, and Renzo, you pointed out that it seems like the first episode of each season is now Ransom destroys the ship or something. <laughs> Just the, the first one of the first season. Ransom gets his gets petrol his zombies. Yeah. The second one, God. The third one, what are we going to have next? Who and knows? Who knows? That's ah. gotta be that's gotta be a real double edged sword of you're probably excited to get these these scripts ahead of time, but having to seeing all the, the surprises or what's going to happen, it's like it it just takes away does it take away any of the of the joy of watching the episode when you already know what's going to be coming up and like quote unquote what the good parts are? Eh, not really. Um, again, it was particularly with the animated, the animated shows. Um, you know, just because I read the script doesn't mean that's what I'm going to see. You know, they'll they'll make they'll make decisions to, you know, they'll make edits and tweaks and changes uh, as the show is developed. And and the same with the live action. I've I've read the scripts for, you know, all all of the shows for the last couple of years. And particularly with the finales, um, they end up changing the finales, you know, to varying degrees, well away from the script that I read. Um, so I get to be surprised a little bit, but I, my wife likes to watch the shows too. So I've insulated her by not talking about what I'm reading in these scripts. I, mm. I keep everything from her so that she can be surprised like a normal person when we're watching TV. But, you know, I'll, and every once in a while, she'll ask me about something. I'll go, you really want me to tell you? And she'll right. say, no, 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 I want to be surprised. I say the you know, same watch thing. the episode. Yeah. Then she watches the episode. She looks at me with this dirty look. She goes, you knew that was going to happen, didn't you? I'm like, yes. Why didn't you tell me? You asked me not to. You know, so we, we do that a few times. It was a, a case of I can't do anything right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I, just, well, I just say I'm sorry a lot. And the, <laughs> these guys, I've I've caught in hell from these guys as well. Uh, it was was it it was Discovery and Picard. Oh, I wouldn't watch the preview. Yeah, it was Discovery. Uh, it both. I wouldn't watch the preview for the next episode. Wouldn't do it. <laughs> And they would want to talk about like the next episode a little bit, and I said, B-b-b-b-b-b-. "I haven't watched the trailer for the next one." Yeah. And I've told this story before to them. You remember the show Twenty Four? Yeah. Oh yeah. Way back when. Okay, so I would not watch the preview for the next episode. I did not <laughs> want to see how Jack Bauer got out of whatever situation he was in there uh, at the end of that episode. So when the episode ended. I change the channel. I would not watch the the preview. Um, and the clock at the top of the hour, you were out. Okay. Right, right. I was done. Okay. I'm, I'm out. No previews. And I did the same uh, the same challenge for. See, it was. I want to say it was Star Trek Into Darkness. Uh, that I did not watch any previews for that. Uh, not for that, and not for the Dark Knight Rises. It was about two years before those that I took on that challenge of. I'm not watching any trailers or anything. I'm going to sit there and just have it be a pure experience. I can't tell you how hard that was. Oh, I was <laughs> dying because I had all my friends saying, hey, Jeff, did you see that that preview for the new Star Trek? Did you see this? I was like, no, no, you're not making this any easier. I'm I'm doing this. It, it was kind of like the, I don't know, the, the ice, the water ice challenge or the the ice uh, tide pod, <laughs> yeah, the ice bucket challenge, or, or the tide pod challenge. You know, I'm doing. I'm, I'm let's doing this not stuff. do tide pods. Oh, right, right, yeah, yeah. Let's let's not let's not do that. That's uh, ivermectin for millennials. I got to watch those. <laughs> I got to watch the three JJ movies like a normal person. I didn't know anything about them going in. Oh, that's um, good. I, that's I was nice. Spoiled. I was spoiled for the season, the first season of Discovery, because I had been contracted to write uh, a Star Trek, a Discovery novel that would premiere right around the time that Lorca's big twist was revealed Ooh. in season could, one. So I you, wrote that book all the way knowing that that was going to happen. So. Could you c- confirm something for me? If you do know about it, it sounds like you were kind of on the behind the scenes. Uh, <laughs> I can't recall where I read this or, or heard this, but in a sense, the, the discovery was just like what they were doing was crazy. Uh, it was ridiculous, and apparently showrunners were smoking crack or something. I, I don't know, but the show was just going off the rails. And eventually, 
it got high enough up. Uh, I, I don't recall the, the, the studio got word that these are the things that are happening. The Klingons are unrecognizable. They're, they're doing this or doing that and this happening. And it was basically came back down of you've got to unfuck this show. Th- this has gotten out of hand because there was, it seemed like there was this sudden hiatus in the middle of the season. And I, b- I believe this is, it may not be true, but I believe what happened was, was that there was a big cor- course correction that was being made to kind of still follow where the season was going, but to try to fix what was behind it and steadily get away from the train wreck that was that was created. It, was there anything like that you, you heard that it was it did not start out the way I guess was expected and there was a, a stopping point to try to figure out, okay, where can we do this? Get get to the off ramp because it's it's not going the way that it was intended. No, they just they, there was a deliberate break in the season. Uh, okay, that was that was always a part of the schedule. I mean, I knew about that well before the, we hit that mid season break, and I had read all the fifteen scripts, so there was no there was no uh, break or lag between one script and another while they retooled. I got to read them all at a regular pace. Um, so uh, that sounds like a YouTube video gun. <laughs> yeah, it does. Uh, yeah, it does. Yeah. Now, as far it, it as the changes that we saw between first and second seasons, you know, a lot of that is attributed to new showrunners with new ideas, and they want to take the show in a different direction. And that, and that, that, that obviously you can see that on the screen between what happened between season one and season two. You, uh, you obviously see the differences as far as a, the tone set by a new showrunner, or in this case, a pair of showrunners. Um, and that, that's that's true of any series of television that, that changes the person at the top of the pyramid because they're so, going gonna to mold that show mm-hmm. the way they want to. That's what they get paid to do. They get, right. they get paid right. ridiculous amounts of money to make a TV show. Wow, I want that kind of money. So, so basically season one like went exactly how it was supposed to. There, there was no like, okay, no, this was it, wrong. It, I don't know if exactly. I mean, you know, the, you know no, no battle plan survives first contact with the enemy. Um, mm-hmm. I'm sure that they dealt with all manner of logistical budget timing issues, and that's before we get into talking about trying to produce a show during a pandemic. I mean, they didn't even have that to think about yet. Right. Um, new show, new idea, new new delivery method. You know, using your big tent full tran- or your big tent full franchise. There's you know all that pressure is on to do it well. Uh, but you know the idea that it got kicked to streaming because it couldn't you know it, it was meant to launch the streaming service or meant to help launch the streaming service it was always going to be that way um, I, I, I see and read and hear a lot of these kind of rumors that get circulated on on the internet and that's what a large amount of them are or, or either it's either rumor unfounded rumor wishful thinking rationalization for why I don't like something yeah um, you know that's just that that's how I look at it personally. Yeah. So yeah. other people might look at it a different way, but so uh, yeah, sitting I here think where I sit, I'm like, no, nah, that's not right. I mean, I read, <laughs> I read rumors every day about what's going to happen on Strange New Worlds or what's going to happen on Picard, and I just laugh because it's never right, you know. So changing tax back a bit to the wood verse, right? You are one of the three authors here who have this challenge of essentially writing the coda hence the name, to a, a literary tradition that's been going on for decades, right? What are some special challenges that you guys had to take in, take apart uh, just to handle this? Because you knew you only had so many books to do it in, right? If they'd given you five books, you could have written five books. But with three, like, what did what were some things you guys had to, like, choose to do? I know you guys, you mentioned that there were these group chats and these mm-hmm. big discussions that everything got hashed out before they got writing to. But what made it so, what made this more unique for you guys? Well, you know, we did originally pitch this as a larger project. Um, oh. I think we pitched it as what we called, I call them four core books. So instead of the three, you would have had at least four. And then I also had pitched um, what I called a couple of stealth setup books, which would be, you might, it might be a next generation novel, it might be a Deep Space Nine novel, it might be some other novel, that to, when at the time of publication, when you read it, it reads like a regular standalone or just, you know, run-of-the-mill Star Trek Next Generation storyline, but once you start to read 
coda, you realize we'd already taken the time to set up pieces on the game board for you. You're like, oh, I got to go back and reread that part. You know, that, that's what I was hoping to do. But unfortunately, circumstances and logistics and, and, and whatever got in the way of that grand plan. And, and we had to whittle it down to three books. Um, so then you start prioritizing. What do you really want to see in this? What's first of all, what's our main goal? And then you work backward from there. And how do we best accomplish that goal? Which characters are best suited to do these things? And, you know, how do we mix them together in such a way? And um, which plot threads from different book lines can we address that A, we can give it time and B, it, it matters to the main story we're trying to tell. We're not going to make everybody happy. I know that already. Um, I've already gotten my one, my first piece of disappointment mail. So <laughs> it hasn't even come out yet. It hasn't even come out officially yet. I've already got somebody who hates me. Man, so, I just wanted you know, to be a just, part of it because the artwork was great. <laughs> there you, go. It's just, you know, but you can't, there's just so much there and we have so little space to really do what we want to do with this properly. You have to make choices and you have to prioritize. And we did the best we could with what we had to work with. And, you know, we had to make some creative choices. We also had to make some choices that respected the wishes of other authors. You know, it's like, oh, well, please don't do this to such and such. Or, please don't do this with this thing. You know, it, I would really appreciate if you didn't blow this up or you know something like that. Mm -hmm. We have an example. Uh, I'm being of very that. vague and very stark oh, okay. when I say that. I'm not. I'm not trying to point you in the direction of something. I'm just saying there were conversations with certain authors about certain things that you know they asked us. Well, I prefer you not go in that direction. Okay, we won't. You know, we'll find another way, or we'll we'll do without, or we'll ever. It's uh, it was a, it was a large undertaking. Anybody who you, thinks we didn't give an example of that by chance. Any no, that you're comfortable? Spoiling no? Anything. Okay. Uh, fair <laughs> enough. Fair enough. Everything's on the right, table. So. I don't want to spoil anything. I mean, um, an example of something you didn't do, though, right? Not something that you did. No, I don't want to okay. do that because all then right, well, right. such and such isn't in the book. I'm like, well, no, that's not what I'm saying at all. <laughs> okay. I, so no spoilers. To do I wanted to pivot off something you said, Dayton. You said that you pitched this book. You pitched it with the other two authors. Um, I wanted to ask about the level of like back and forth between you as an author with this idea and and CBS who may or may not have a direction. Is it the you pitch an idea and they go, hey, that sounds kind of good. Do these five things and off you go. Or do they come at you and are like, we want a transition series. We want you to write it. Go forth. We came to them. We, we came to our editors first and we said we you know we under you know we know where we know where where things stand we know where things are with the series that's coming at this point we're talking about star trek picard that's still a year or more from premiering because we had these first conversations i had my first conversation about this topic probably in early to mid 2018 uh is when i can i can remember taking my first notes because that's when i first started seeing information coming out of the writer's room for picard this is before they even announced the series in Vegas. Okay. I'd already started to see documents and I'd started to see story synopses documents and the backstory document that Kirsten Beyer had put together for writers on the show to give them sort of a Star Trek primer, you know, and, they, and, they, and not just stuff that has already happened that, we, that fans would already know about, but things they had invented for Picard's backstory, you know, the backstory that would inform season one. That was already in a document. So I, once I got to see that, I knew where the stakes were in the ground and how they impacted the books, not just the ones that we wanted to write, but the books we'd already written. And so I was having those, I started taking notes with this stuff three years ago and I didn't actually get a chance to have a conversation with Dave Mack about it at length until a year later when we got to meet together at a, at a, at a convention and we sat in the bar and we, we talked this out. Um, and you know, come to find out, Dave had been doing very similar things. He had been taking notes and pondering and talking to an editor and figuring out what we could do. And we finally figured out, okay, we're we're already aligned, you know, more or less. We'll just now we just need to, you know, get in step with each other and bring in somebody else. And uh, once we figured out which writers were going to be involved, then we we started running. Uh, yeah, it's it's a it's a it was a it was a very collaborative and very intense little process there for a while so what led to this basically you woke up one day and just decided you know i'm going to reset everything that happened in the the, the trek lit verse or or transition it was it something that you you saw or heard or said that made you want to take on something like this taking all these works and saying okay yes it did happen but we're we're 
moving on. We're g- going to go in this other different direction. I knew that as soon as I knew that they were going to make Star Trek Picard, which was very early in 2018. I had a conversation with Kirsten Beyer, and she told me, you know, we're, we've been friends for years, and she called me and told me, and I had been giving her, I, she had been calling me throughout the production of, of season one of Discovery because she was also helping me with, as I wrote that novel. And so she started telling me about Picard and, you know, my, the first, the first warning bell, like, oh, that could be a problem for the books. You know, I had that first notation in my head. And then once I saw the backstory document that she had put together, I'm like, okay, now I know where the, now I know what I'm dealing with. Um, so for me, it was middle, middle of 2018 when I knew that something had to be done, didn't know what it was going, or something was going to happen. Didn't know what that was going to be. Didn't know why, didn't know to what extent. Um, but I had started taking notes that far. I started building a timeline on a spreadsheet of all the cool Star Trek things that happened in the films and on the different TV shows and in the books and um, started figuring out, you know, where are the threads that we can pull on. Um, and I had had a conversation or two with my editors at Simon & Schuster about, you know, we should start thinking about this. Um, again, no real idea of what that was going to be. We were still waiting to see what the show was going to do. You know, we were still basically waiting for the for Picard to develop to a point where we had a clear understanding of what they were going to do with their first season. Okay, so was, yeah. why ahead. Picard and what was it you read that you saw that prompted the thought of this is this is why we need to do something? Why was it okay. Picard and what was it you saw that made you come <clears throat> to that conclusion? Well, it was Picard because they knew because they, they told me that they were gonna set Picard twenty years after Star Trek Nemesis. Right. Which is more or less where the books were operating. So already okay, okay. we knew that we had a potential for a conflict. Right. Um, right. What keyed it off for me was when I read the backstory document, and I can't, it's not a spoiler now because it's from season one. Um, I read about the Mars attack, uh, which mm-hmm. takes place in 2385, which at the time was almost two years in the past of the continuity we had established in the books. Right. Okay. Okay. So to me, that was a triggering event in terms of, okay, well, it's already a problem because we... <laughs> Episode yeah. one, problem. Yeah. Yep. So it's like, okay, it's already an issue. I, I guess problem is not the right word. A challenge or an issue. It's a challenge. Uh, um, so that's our challenge is the fact that, you know, the, the big event that motivates Star Trek Picard, um, you know, is right in our backyard. And we've already, we're already well enough, we're already too far past it. It's not like we can just say, oh, and by the way, Mars blew up two years ago. You can't just do that. <laughs> I mean, I guess right. you can, but you'd end up pissing off a lot of people. We can't go to Mars. Then... It's still on fire. What? <laughs> we can just call the time to invoke legends, you know, or whatever. That'll make everybody happy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I knew we didn't want to do a legends. I knew we didn't want to do a thing where we go, well, okay, well, that's it. We'll just flip a switch and then we'll just pick up where the, where the TV show. Nobody, want, nobody wanted to do that. That was never a serious consideration. Good. Uh, well, the Whipverse yes. fan and like fans that definitely appreciate you doing that, then, right? Like giving us some form of closure is just great. Considering what happened to the expanded universe of Star Wars, that like flip of a switch yeah. left a lot of people yeah. very, very hurt. Oh yeah, I, I'm not even a big Star Wars reader. I, I mean, I've I've read, you know, I don't know, a couple of dozen of them over the years, maybe. Um, but you know, as a fan of of tie-in material, that kind of thing. It's, I'm of two minds. Like, yes, I'm a tie-in writer, so I know the job's dangerous, and that anything I write can be circumvented by later, later canon. You know, that's just you know, the job is dangerous, and we know that when we take it. Uh, but as a fan and a reader, I get that. I get that sense of I can't believe I spent all that time and money reading these books, and they just totally wiped them away. Yep. I understand that. Um, with Star Trek, though, it's different because we always knew they weren't canon, and and you know they they could they could, they could face a reset at any point, and it's just this was the. I think this is unprecedented in the way that, in a way, because we were allowed so much latitude for so many years to do the things that we did in the pages of those books uh, across the different series and across, with all the different characters. I mean, I don't, I can't think of a comparable example where we had that kind of ongoing freedom to play with these characters uh, to and then get to a point where all of a sudden it cranks up production again and, we, and we're faced with the reality of what basically every line of tie-in books about every movie or film has always faced you know that, uh, that you're going to be overwritten by what's on tv um it just it's just odd that it came that way so we felt it warranted something more than just saying okay you know flip the switch we'll, we'll you know 
I, I, I wanted, I used the DC Comics analogy that we were talking before. I said, those guys were given an opportunity to retool their storylines and get back in, in sync with the films. Can we do that with these books? Um, you guys get to read it and decide if we did it or not. I love Is there anything you want to tell us? Go ahead. Uh, sorry, I was just going to say one, one observation based on what, what Renzo said, and then a, another question for you, Dayton. So, Renzo, I think the reason that that happened with Star Wars, and this is a big spoiler, I don't recall which book it is right off the top of my head. It has to deal with a, a very major character. So, if you don't want to hear any spoilers about any of the Star Wars books, it's seven years ago. Star Wars books. It's Darth right, Sidious right. and Darth Plagueis. No, 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 he's talking a, about Chewbacca having there, Serpentil fall on him. Yeah, there I you know. go. Yeah, so I, I think maybe that it was because they they went that far that it was a okay. Now I don't think that's this, fair because the Star Trek Whitverse has done way bigger than that. Yeah, no, oh, yeah. the Star Trek Whitverse has been major changes in that. They have okay. Janeway died. Uh, the or Pluto as a planet got absorbed into a Borg contraption. <laughs> they blew up. Parts of Vulcan and Doria's depopulated. Like they've done Nausicaa all sorts of was Mary assimilated Hill. by the Borg. Yeah. No, Jesus. They, yeah. yeah, no. The Star Trek lip verse went through its apocalypse, right? And the yeah. Typhon Pact is More what's come one. afterwards. And y- yes, that was you know that was so. the other thing too. You know, Dave Mack did a quite fine job of obliterating the Borg. You know, in in the Destiny trilogy. And right. Oh, that trilogy was great. Yeah, and then lo and behold, here's a Borg in Star Trek card season one there's a board ship and it's like well so okay there's another we, challenge yeah. that we have to deal with that's another one so, makes perfect sense I, I think the problem it's not a problem the difference between star trek and star wars is that star trek has always made no bones about the fact that novels and comics and other expanded media are not part of the canon right whereas star wars they tried to have their cake and eat it too you know they tried to tell all the fans that this is this these books and these novels are canon they're they're levels of canon which is sort of like you know levels of pregnancy or levels of circumcision <laughs> and, and I, I i equate it as like you either canon, top it off or you don't you're you know, only mostly it is like being pregnant or being circumcised you either are or you're not <laughs> and you know and so i think george lucas finally came out at one point not that long ago and acknowledged yeah i didn't pay attention to any of that stuff i just paid attention to the movies i was making Hmm. So by default, that means the Star Trek stuff really wasn't canon. Not, not really. Not in any way that mattered. Right. They, right. You know, they, they may have said, "Well, as long as we don't contradict it, it's canon." Okay. I'm like, "All oh, right, that's fine." But no film director is going to stand on a soundstage with a you know a hundred million dollar movie that they're helming, and they go, "I can't do this because some guy wrote a comic in 1984." Nope. Right. That right. seven of you wrote, you know, seven of you. That's never going to happen. Nope. As far as I know, that's never happened. And if, if somebody has an example of that, I'd like to hear it. Um, right. And even when I hear it, I'm not doing it. Uh, so, and this was this was the the question that I had is, what keeps the books from falling away from that thread of being coordinated? What what keeps this from having to happen again, s- somewhere down the line? Oh, well, I mean, ideally, since Star Trek is active now, again, and uh, there are, you know, there are there are people working at CBS who are invested in the idea that we, we are trying to give these expanded media platforms room to maneuver, so to speak, and give them safe spaces where they can operate and maybe not get overwritten quite so cavalierly. Um, and not to imply that this was cavalier, it's, it wasn't. Um, but the idea that, you know, it's kind of like what Lucasfilm established with their story group. You know, they, 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 they put together the folks who can say, OK, you can do these things in the books and you can do these things in the comics and these two talk to each other. And if you stay within these, you know, this perimeter, then the movies aren't going to walk over you too much or not at all, hopefully, in the best case scenario. But I think even that's been you know shown to be pie in the sky to a certain degree. I mean, again, we go back to the to the to the example of the film director is never going to cede to the comic book writer. Okay, it's just not going to happen. Um, and I think the same is but again, they set that trap for themselves when they established, you know, the quote levels of canon unquote in Star Wars, whereas Star Trek just said, yeah, none of that's canon. We're not, you know, we're not following it for better or worse, depending on how you feel about it. Um, my my thing about canon is it's great if you are writing for the shows and it's great to have in hand if you are writing any of the products tying into the shows but if you're just a fan it really shouldn't matter i mean it's just if you think the vanguard novels happened 
then they happen. I think they happen. I think the Vanguard novels happen, and I think certain episodes of various TV shows never happen because I hate them. <laughs> I won't name them out loud. But they're threshold. threshold. <laughs> Shadow play. <clears throat> and the of honor. Shadow Lee. You no know, threshold. Of honor. That kind of stuff. Um, I, you know, it's in my head, those episodes did not happen, but the Vanguard novels, every single word in all of those books happen hmm. in my head. So Great is, books, too. Yeah. Is this kind of a way to... I, I don't want to use placate or satisfy but is this a way for the writers to get a better uh, i guess a, a sense of we don't want you to spend all this time on this book and this novel and this writing just for your work to be negated by the next episode of a show yes. or, or the next movie because i would i would think that if that keeps happening, you're going to say, okay, why am I doing this? Why am I spending all this time and effort writing this, writing this book just for it to be blown away, uh, you know, by the, by the next series or, or the next yeah. show? Well, I mean, it, it goes back to what I said before. Anybody who does this for any length of time, they know that that's a possibility. Uh, that's just the nature of the beast. Um, you write the best story you can, the most entertaining story you can, based on the, the property as you know it to be when you write the book. You can't, you can't future-proof everything. Right. right. Um, what you can do is just, you know, you, you, you do the best job you can when you're at bat. Um, and it's just the, that's anything else is out of your control. It, I mean, the studios are going to do what they think they need to do to make money with this property, and the people who read. You know the people who the, the people who read the best-selling, most popular number of units pushed Star Trek novel in the history of the franchise is still a fraction of the people who watch the lowest-rated episode of any right, TV series. Right, right. It's just it, it's just simple. It's just simple math. You know, you got to go where the most eyeballs are. Um, but that said, for us as writers of this material, we know that the people who read the books are very devoted and very supportive and very passionate about them um, and we are too because to a person every one of us is a fan um, a, I mean a deep hardcore fan like have them on your drunken trivia team because they're going to help out <laughs> oh man if you um, want to do trivia so we can do trivia I'd love it's that as, yeah. it's as much for us as it is for the readers I mean we, we are, are getting a chance to do something unprecedented or at least largely unprecedented in this And as time. authors, you get to do very different things than the shows do anyways, right? Like, there's there's nothing on TV that's going to come up that's like Articles of the Federation from Keith DeCandido, right? Like, there's nothing on there. There's no Star Trek meets West Wing, which is essentially what that book was, I don't right? Like, and I it's... Don't... I don't. I, there was a time when I would have said that never happened, but I mean, it's just, I mean, I you know, never shocked. say never in this business, you know. I, just, right. uh, well, I mean, let's let's not kid ourselves here. The books are licensed and produced by an organization that, at the top of the food chain, they're there to make the money. Who yeah. is going to buy these books? The fans. What do the fans yeah. want? They want what they're watching, and this transition, I think, is one of the perfect ways to keep the new fans ones who found it through the JJ verse and discovery and Picard, those fans are going to be the ones who are going to be going to the books. The old fans who've already been brought along 20 years of the relaunch novels and Rebecca Cisco and all those other things. Um, those fans are going to go right along with this. And honestly, between you, James and David, I, I don't think the lit verse franchise can be in better hands because you are the fans I, 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 and you love this stuff so much like it's the perfect way to yeah. shepherd the old and the new into this transition any well, regrets for all this though out of curiosity Dayton any regrets for things that you couldn't include that you didn't get to do or things that you did in a previous book that you're like shit I wish I would have known that Discovery <laughs> was going to do this or that Picard was going to do that uh, he, regret, he regrets killing the current lit verse no I'm just kidding <laughs> Well, first of too all, too soon. Too soon. Back to the back to your <laughs> point. Uh, um, thank you, and on behalf of Jim and Dave, I thank you uh, for the kind words. Um, you know, th th there's a fine line that we have to walk. It's that you know the tie-in books that we write have to be accessible uh, to a to a broader audience, or we at we attempt to make them accessible to as broad an audience as feasible. But we also know that there's a very core you know, there's a core group of people who read these books, and they've been along for the entire ride. So. 
how do you balance the need to make the books accessible you know to 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 people who are brand new to this there are people who are going to be reading these books that have never read a star trek book before but they they've heard the hype they're hearing about it they're going to somebody's going to talk about it they're going to pick it up or they're going to see it in the store and they're going to think it looks cool and they're going to give it a shot you want that person you want to bring that person into the fold but at the same time you also want to do right by the people who've been there by your side the whole way so it's hard it's it's a hard act to balance you know it's tough to to try to meet all of that so but as fans of this material that's where our heart is when we do this particularly something like this we know what it means to people we're trying not to do it wrong and whether we do it right or not and we, we manage to transition to what the shows are going to be doing that's for you all to decide um as far as regrets ah i don't know i got to do some stuff in this book that i have never been able to do in any star trek book uh me personally so and without spoiling anything um i got to have a lot of fun's not the right word i just i got i got a lot of freedom to do some things that i never thought i'd be able to do in a star trek book and you'll understand what that what that means once you read my book and this particularly after you've read jim and dave's because a lot of what i'm doing in book one sets up the action in book two and book three now i think i'm gonna um, have to read these books so we're definitely going you know, to so yeah. hopefully you know we did right hopefully we did right by as many people as as we could well, i'd love well, to get you back on the show after they're all out and we can actually talk about them like it's yeah with, uh, hindsight yes. in, in, in assuming assuming we're not in hiding and fearful for our lives sure <laughs> well, we'll be back oh, we'll always be trick there fans won't be that way but well, i'm I'm not a big book reader, so that, that's why I say that. I so I should, if I'm going to read anything, I can't even remember the last time I read a book. It, it's got to be over ten years, because everything's just online now. It, it, it's hard for me to sit and read a book because I could be saying to myself, "I'm sure there's something else I should be doing right now, <laughs> or, or could be doing." And ooh, squirrel, things <laughs> like that. Uh, so going back just real, real quick uh, about trying to keep the writers happier about not having their their work trampled on have there been any good writers that actually quit and left and stopped because of situations like that where they do the uh, you write these novels and then it just gets gets blown away i i don't i'm not aware of that uh, I, I mean, there are people who used to write Star Trek novels that don't write them anymore for a variety of reasons. Um, but I, I don't know of anybody who like just, just decided they'd had enough and didn't want to do it anymore. Um, if, if that's the case, they've never communicated that to me. Um, at least not that way, for sure. I mean, you know, right. sometimes, sometimes people, you know, I, I can't even hold myself up as a typical Star Trek novelist because... I just dig doing it. I'll do it for as long as they let me. Uh, I, I I will I will ride this wave until somebody drop kicks me right out of the boat. Dream and then job. I'll hang on for dear life. What's that? Uh, you've got my dream job. <laughs> no, I mean it's 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 been a hell of a ride. It's been it's been a lot of fun. I've gotten I've, I've been you know blessed with a lot of opportunities because of that silly contest from twenty odd years ago. But I, I will you know some people decide they want to write other things and they they move on to do that or they write both and they don't write as many Star Trek novels as they used to. Um, I think it's there's a mix of everything out there in, in terms of the, the stable of writers who have contributed to Star Trek over the years. Um, it, I don't know. It's just it's just one of those things that cycle. It's, I guess it's cyclical. Sooner or later, somebody's going to get tired of my crap and I'm not going to write anymore. Star Trek. But <laughs> that day that is day, not today. But today is not that day. Okay. You know? Nope. I have uh, a so, questions about uh, Moments Asunder. Um, Renzo, if you're going to ask a more relevant question before I kind of like switch back over. No, it, it's it's just a question about a particular uh, thread that the Litverse took. That I wanted to see if Dayton had a particular take on it at all. Go for it. Okay, so Dayton, I'm sure you're aware that uh, Bill Shatner and uh, uh, Judith and Judith Reese Garfield wrote mm-hmm. a series of the Shatnerverse novels, is what they've been nicknamed, mm-hmm. right? I know where you're going. Were, I know that they're generally not considered a part of the mainstream Litverse canon or the storyline that was being followed. Did you enjoy those novels yourself personally? Did you find any ideas from those that you wish you could have brought back in somehow or anything along those lines? I find that, admittedly, those are the first novels of Star Trek that I read and those were what got me into it. And then I expanded and read everything else, right? right? So that's kind of why I asked. Mm-hmm. I read the first, oh, let me think. I know I read the first six that took us through the mirror universe arc that he wrote. Mm-hmm. 
I don't know that I read the next trilogy, the Captain's Blood, Peril, Blood, those, Peril, yeah. Glory. I don't think I read those, and I did not read the Academy book that he did. Um, not for lack of desire. I have a copy on my shelf. I just have not gotten to. It. Um, I remember enjoying the first Shatner book particularly, um, the the one that he kind of had as a sequel to Star Trek Six, mm-hmm. um, and the Return. I enjoyed it, but man, that had Bill Shatner written all over it. So, <laughs> yes, that's, it did. I, I just I have to jump in right there because you mentioned earlier that you're the kind of person that you want to have on your trivia team at the pub. That book was the tie-breaking question at my trivia game at my pub like three years <laughs> oh. ago, and they were like, "Okay, here's the question." They barely got it out of their throat before I'm screaming, "Bill Shatner!" Because they wanted to <laughs> they wanted to know who wrote. You know the return of, the of, return, of Captain yeah. Kirk after he died, and and I was just like, ah! Well, it immediately followed generations, and right. it, it mm-hmm. had it had Bill's name all over it because it was, I'm not satisfied with what was done with my character, so I'm going to br- bring it back and have it be a more, yeah. It's I I read that one, and I got to tell right. you, it was it was an interesting read, but. It was. It bordered on the ridiculous, honestly. Was, with I mean, and 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 we, as the writers of the other Star Trek novels, you know, we had been advised that that the the the, the, the Shatnerverse novels were their own thing. Okay. Um, okay. They, and we were not to we were not to uh, overtly make any overt references to them. That said, I think I managed to sneak in one or two references every once in a oh, while. Nice. On the sly, I don't, they're great. not they're not obvious at all, but. Because at the time I was just digging on the idea that you know Bill Shatter's writing Star Trek novels, that's pretty cool, you know, um, or helping write Star Trek novels or whatever. Um, I I don't know, just as a fan, I thought it was I got a kick out of it. I think what happened was that Mr. Shatner had the idea that he would get his search for Spock movie. Mm. Uh, oh, and I that there, would, there would be there would be a there would be a, a re, you know a re- resurrection of, of Captain Kirk in a future Star Trek film, uh, and obviously that was not to be. Um, so he t- he retooled his idea to, to work as a book. Um, well, there was an Into Darkness, right? Kirk died yeah. and got kept brought back. It just wasn't, <laughs> oh, it wasn't yeah, it was, Kirk. I, come on, man. Yeah. A, lot of, just, a lot of people, a lot of people, you know, make issue of the fact that he writes. He wrote those with the Reeve Stevens, and you know, who did what, and how much did he actually write? And you know, I I, I have no problem on believing that you know the Reeve Stevens probably did a lot of the heavy lifting as far as the actual you know actual hard part of writing the book but uh, knowing what i know about him i know he was involved in the storyline i know he was involved with his thoughts about the character i know he poured over the things and a lot of people forget that way back when you know long before he was captain kirk you know he 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 acted on stage and he wrote plays for the theater that he worked in in montreal so the idea that he's a writer is not outside the realm right well and he did all the tech war series and stuff too but i mean this is before that i mean we're talking in the 50s he was writing stuff i mean and and people forget that but of course you know bill shatner then and bill shatner now are two completely different people he just doesn't the man has boundless energy it's ridiculous how much energy the guy has at 90 years old uh, i hope i have half that energy when i'm his age i hope i make it to his age number one and i'm you know, 44 and i don't have that energy <laughs> I right now just, I was at a I was at a thing where he was at uh, back in July up at the Star Trek set tour up in up you know Ticonderoga, New York, mm-hmm. and the man is a machine. Uh, I mean, okay. he's just I, I I get tired just watching him do his thing. Wow. And regardless of what anybody has to say about the the Shatnerverse novels, whether you think they're amazing or not, I still find them wonderfully entertaining. They're on my bookshelf next to my Invasion series. Um, oh, you read Invasion? I've got. I, I just yeah, I posted them in the server today because Spice oh, wanted them. That it's one was awesome friend. too. But yeah, though I mean, I I can't get enough, and I'll take it whichever way I can, whether I like it or not. Um, but to onto onto moments of sunder, I have uh, two questions. One for the audience: Are there any books that have already come out that are available now that? the audience should maybe read or to, reread or reread to sort of brief them on the direction that coda is going to take them well i will tell you that everything you need to know about what's come before is in the books okay uh, 
we we do we do what we can to bring everybody up to speed and, and, and in furthering that not just in the narrative but each book has a section at the front normally all the Star Trek books have a brief you know what they call an historian's note you know this this book takes place at this point in time uh, we went hog wild with that idea and we we wrote a I think it's each book has a three or four page section that outlines all the heavy points from various That's novels that's going awesome. back all the way to DS9's finale and coming forward. That's fantastic. So, so it's already it, written in there to give you it, what right. you need to know. It okay. gives you the plot point, you know, inside the box, and then it tells you which book that came from. And okay. those are what we consider to be the key points uh, that drive Coda or link to Coda. Um, there, I think Dave may have published, a, I have to check his feed, he may have done it today. Um, he had published a brief list of books that he thought would be good, re, you know, worthy of revisiting if you had the time and inclination to do so. And it, it, as it happens in the best Star Trek tradition possible, he came up with 47 books. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, and I don't know that that, I don't know that he went ahead and actually published that or he's holding off until tomorrow. I don't recall offhand. Anyway, as storytellers, our job is to bring you in and hopefully not leave you flailing. Um, and I, and we, we did our best to do that. But as an extra extra kick, we added that those previously on sections. So you can almost hear Majel Barrett saying previously on Star Trek. You know, right. I love it. So. I love it. The second the second question I have is a, a bit more invasive into the story itself. But if if there's anybody out there who is a who is a fan of, you know, let's say uh, any any given specific character. Would you be able to say, "Hey, if you're fans of Worf, you really want to you really want to read this book." You don't have to say anything. I'm just asking if you can. Yes, you can do that. I mean, you can you can. It, I mean, I I would be hard pressed to think of particularly a major character, um, not counting um, you know obviously the dead ones, the, the Yar, dead ones. Janeway. Yeah, the people who are legitimate. Well, yeah, the people who are legitimately dead uh, in in the novel verse or wherever. Um, you know, all of the main casts from the, particularly from the 24th century shows, are, are represented as particularly, you know, in the context of how they appear in the novels continuity that we've established and, and progressed with. Um, there are a few surprises. There are a couple of uh, interesting callbacks. Um, we were basically given a mandate to, you know, swing for the fences uh, on this one. Uh, that was, great. that was basically, if you boil down our editor's directions, it was just like, you know, go for it, go for broke YOLO. And, <laughs> uh, I love it. I love no, it. I was think it? if you're a fan, particularly of the 24th century shows, you, somebody you love is in there somewhere. Oh, was absolutely. there anything? Uh, I'm sorry, Dad, go ahead. Oh, I was confirming. Yes. I, I'm dying to read I mean, the series. There are like, I mean, again, we take into account the, the direction of various series and where the characters are and, and where you know where things are on the board where we need them you know in relation to where our story picks up but if it made sense to bring them in then we did we tried to do so was there anything in a previous book or episode or, or movie that just completely killed an idea that you had or something that you wanted to do wanted to do badly enough and maybe thought about you, you know this is this is very valid for what we're doing in this this book in this uh three-part book but this one this novel from a couple or so or whatever years ago completely uh takes away our ability to do this one major thing and you know what we're just gonna have we're just gonna do it and hope that nobody has read that book or remembers that part anything like that i can't consciously think of anything where we i, I can't think of anything where we made the conscious decision to say that doesn't count uh or that book didn't count now again i'm talking about within the context of the established continuity mm -hmm. the, the interconnected the interconnected continuity is the prime mover i mean i, I can't I, I can't say we didn't you know, contradict a novel that's not part of that extended continuity that was published 30 years ago or 20 years ago, or 25 years ago. Um, but as far as the interconnected continuity across all the different series, we, as far as I remember, we were able to find a workaround if we encountered a conflict. Like we were able to figure out a way to, to deal with that potential obstacle. Gotcha. Okay. That's good. So it sounds like there weren't, for as many books, as there are not not to mention the 
episodes and movies, it sounds like you guys were able to walk through the the minefield and not really yeah. not really touch any. Well, I mean, I mean, that, mean, that's a feat right there in a, in of itself. And, you know, and it could be that this the the, the the end the result that we ended up on was okay. That book established that this thing happened, and we can't undo that. So we're not going to touch that. We're going to go in a different direction. We're going to, uh, you know, we're going to, we're going to uh, acknowledge it and find another way to tell a story that we need to tell. Uh, you know, again, other writers have done things with different characters, different different situations, and you know, they've let some of them, you know, left them in places that they preferred we leave them there. Um, so we did that as best we could. Um, other situations were naturally resolved or they were left unresolved in a way that gave us wiggle room. You know, it's like, oh, well, you know what? They never really did say what happened to so-and-so. Nobody knows. We can totally make that work. Well, yeah, you know, yeah. Mace Windu is still alive. Sure. Exactly. You know. You know, or whatever. <laughs> and then, so, I mean, there, there were a lot, there was, there are so many different permutations to that question and different ways that we had to uh, deal with that because there's just so much going on in these three books. Um, hey, Renzo, that, no one saw him hit the pavement. I, I saw it's true. You yeah. didn't find a body, did you? you know, yeah, there's no body. It's not murder if you can't find a body. <laughs> so, Dayton, I've got one last question, and I'm going to take a step back from Star Trek on this one. So, just as a nerd's nerd, somebody who reads a lot of science fiction, it seems, and who's very familiar with everything that's going on in there, are there any novels, classics, anything else that you particularly find yourself always being like, man, I want to write something kind of like this, but damn, that'd be too much like Dune. Or that sounds a little bit like Realm Through with Rama, right? Like any of your great all-time favorites that you just find yourself always being like, that thing is so good. I wish I could reference it somehow. The closest thing I can come up to is I had an idea for a novel that I was going to pitch, not a Star Trek novel. I was going to develop a, an original science fiction idea. And it was about a war that was being fought and the people who were fighting it were pulled from different points in time and deposited at a different point in time. And Ooh. then that Chris Pratt movie comes out. Yeah, <laughs> oh, I was just thinking God. that. Called The Tomorrow yeah. War. I'm like, well, well, there you go. So I fed that into a shredder. And I had, <laughs> I had been thinking about this off and on for, for uh, several years. And um, not really, it just seemed like anytime I tried to get any head, head of steam on it, I got pulled back into Star Trek or something else or just laziness or whatever so you know i saw this movie advertised for amazon i'm like that's so close to my story they'll say i'm ripping them off damn yeah. oh well so you know well, that's what i get for dragging my feet and in the overall grand scheme of things if there was something you missed <clears throat> some piece of canon or whatever it is rest assured a star trek fan is going to find it yes and you're going to be hammered on that one thing it's going to be one sentence that you should not have written that's just going to tank oh. the entire novel. You just wait for it. Yeah. You, yeah. Jay, you, Jay, you, Jay, you sound like my Twitter feed. That happens <laughs> with every book, though. That happens with every book I've ever written. So, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. that's not new territory. I've got the scars. Yeah. You got a Dramatis Persona in these, by the way? I'm sorry? You the DS9 did, you put a, did you put a Dramatis Persona in these, in these books? Just like cast of characters kind of thing with who they are now, that kind of thing? Oh, no, not for this one, no. Okay. I mean, uh, no, I didn't. I didn't. I mean, we've done that for for other projects that we've worked on. Like, we did it for the Vanguard novels and this, and this, or Dave did it for the Vanguard novels, and then we repeated that idea for the Seekers novels that we did. Um, but we did not do that for this. I mean, there's so many characters, they already have faces in this thing. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, so, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Renzo, could you... Could you guys tell me what what that is? I guess I'm sure. not. The dramatis persona is something that they have in plays, particularly. It's usually it's found in some books, but it's like the Captain Picard, Captain of the USS Enterprise, Jean Luc Picard. Maybe it'll say where he's from. Then it'll be like William T. Riker, uh, blah blah blah, from such and such. And it just gives you like their rank or position, kind of. It just it's not supposed to be like their biography. It's just like, it's like if a cast you don't list. know who these are, here's your cast list. I've seen yeah. those. I, I didn't, yeah, didn't realize didn't that's what that. it was called. Yeah. We didn't do that for this, no, because we just figured, you know, if you're if you're reading a Star Trek novel, you're probably going to be up to date with the people on the cover or the people in the cast. Um, that I mean, we've done that. I don't think we've ever done that even with the original characters that we created. Uh, hmm. It's just I don't know. It's just not one of those things. Now, for the for 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 writing the for writing the the Vanguard and the Secret novels, you know, again we had a Bible for those books that we put together. 
uh, or Dave put it together for Vanguard, and then we put a, we put together a revised version of the Vanguard one with the emphasis on the Seekers characters. Um, and we we went so far as to provide you know backstories for those characters, and even even a headshot for who our dream actor would be to play that role if this was on TV, you know that kind of thing. Just for our for our own consistency, like okay, I can write this character because. <clears throat> I think Steve Buscemi plays him in the movie. You know, I think. <laughs> gotcha. It gives him a voice in your head. Yes, exactly. Right. Well, I think that just for length of of the book and of these works, the reader has to come in with you, you have to have some expectation that you've you've read this or you know this character because we can't do background stories and give a synopsis of mm. every background character it's kind of like for um i don't know if you're a marvel fan or not but the avengers movies especially mm. infinity war and, and endgame to completely understand all of that it's your responsibility to have walked in and have seen the 20 movies or whatever <laughs> yeah. it is prior to that because it's like okay th this movie is going to be three hours already we, we cannot do backstories or how we got here just yeah. if you want if you want to understand it then you will have made sure that you've watched yeah. all these up to this yeah. point if you don't then you know th this movie is not the one that's going to do that for you yeah there, we did the backstories they're in the other 20 movies yeah. right <laughs> yeah we've got i mean not books. to be flippant not 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 to be flippant again that's what you know that's what the the previously sections are in the beginning of each book is it it provides what we consider to be the high points yeah, uh, yeah of the of the narrative that informs coda uh you know the, the from across all the different series um and we think that that is obviously you're gonna you're gonna get more out of it if you've been following us along the entire way or you somehow jumped on the train at some point in the interim 20 years and you caught caught up in time for coda you're gonna get more out of it oh, of course but you've never read a star trek novel in your life but you're familiar with the characters who populate these novels you know who captain picard is and you know who captain cisco is and, and that sort of thing then then you're not coming in and getting lost you're going to be able to pick up the narrative because if we did our jobs correctly you'll have everything you need as the story goes along you can only help so much i mean really at the end of the day there's only so much you can do if if someone's picking up this book and the only thing they know about star trek is wrath of khan and that one with the whales in it well then, no you're, you're not you're not going to understand this and there's not really nothing we can do about it because yeah there's yeah. just way too much to, to have to because you mentioned this character but then you got to tell <clears throat> this story to back up the story you just said and then you have to go here it's like okay well but well, wait a minute you, you, then before you know it you're almost to the center of the earth with the rabbit hole you dug because you're trying to trying to give all this all this background info and, and background character and you just you you can't you can't do that you you can't cater to every level of star trek viewership or yeah. or readership I've been sitting here pondering how to succinctly put this. I guess the, I just updated the phrase. You can lead them to the stars, but you can't make them trek. You know, you just... <laughs> and I think that's a perfect uh, end cap for the episode. Dayton, I want to thank you so much for giving us your time today. It has been truly enlightening to get uh, your wisdom on this side of the Star Trek universe and its development, your participation in it. Um, for the audience, uh, check out Star Trek Coda Book One, Moments Asunder. If you're listening to this right now, it is out today. And uh, thank you for going boldly with Beyond Trek Podcast. Hey, uh, Dayton, if you have any socials that you want to share with us, this would be a great opportunity here. Tell people where to look you up or anything like that. If you're looking for additional commentary. Yeah, you can find me at DaytonWard.com, and that'll have links to my blog and Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and uh, I think my Amazon author page is still on there and just, basically just one stop shopping for internet banality. That's me, DaytonMoore.com. Banality, great word. Awesome. Thanks again. Thanks Thank for you. having me. Thank you. We are Beyond Trek Podcast. Lower your inhibitions and surrender your years. We will add inspirational and hilarious Trek content to your day. Your attention will adapt to subscribe to us. Resistance is futile. <laughs>